All right, good morning. Thank you everyone who's able to join us today uh, in the audience and also on by WebEx. Welcome. This is National Disability Employment Awareness Month and this event today is brought to you by the Office of Civil Rights. We'd like to, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Monique Dismuke and I'm the Disability Program Manager for the department. I also work in the Office of Civil Rights. We have a distinguished panel of guests with us today who will give us an opportunity to learn a little bit more about them and they'll tell their story. They're employees that work within the Department of Commerce. Before I get a chance to introduce them, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Disability Awareness Month. Um, during this month, we have an opportunity to celebrate the many and varied contributions of employees with disabilities and educate everyone on the value of a workforce that's inclusive of everyone's abilities their talents, and their skills. To be a diverse and inclusive organization, we have to learn to focus on each person's abilities and what they bring to the department. For this reason, you'll hear the term differing abilities. Uh, we'll use that often today instead of disabilities. So commerce employs many types of uh, individuals with various disabilities, with various abilities, I'm sorry, with various abilities. Uh, we have abil different abilities in what we do, uh, what our capabilities are, and each person has strengths and challenges. So a person's ability is the resources they possess for pre performing well at something. So each of us, we all possess different strengths and we all have different challenges. So when we use the term different ab abilities, it's important to understand that each of us have a different ability and we all should be supported in our jobs. Okay, so let me give you an example. If an employee has a very analytical mind and they're able to access ideas and pinpoint flaws, find solutions and identify problems, an agency would want to hire that person in a particular analytical field. That ability is a major asset to the organization. Now, a person may have a disability that may limit or challenge what he or she, uh, how she does the job or may create challenges in what he or she does or how they perform a task. This doesn't mean the person is not able to perform the task. They just may have to perform the task with an accommodation. So for example, you have an employee in an agency that may be a deaf employee. They face certain challenges that others might not face. The disability doesn't mean the person's not able to do the job. They were hired with that skill, that talent, that ability to be able to do that job, right? So. It only means that they face some limitations in performing the task and the provision of that uh, reasonable accommodation mitigates that for them so that they can successfully do the job. In fact, every person in the organization is provided an accommodation. When you think about it, a computer is an accommodation. Lights, having lights in the building, that's an accommodation. Being able to have a chair to sit at your desk and do your job, that's an accommodation. So with those various different accommodations, we can easily and more effectively and efficiently do our jobs. So having a variety of, of uh, talents and limitations in an organization is a sign of a diverse organization and then intentional, deliberate, and proactive actions that make a person feel belong, like they belong and they are uniquely valued in the organization, that's a sign of inclusion. So today I have the pleasure of introducing you to some of our commerce employees with differing abilities. These employees come, from, uh, come to us from different bureaus. They're represented um, by NTIA, ITA, and BIS. They will share their individual stories and experiences and help us to get to know more about them. So I'd like to ask you all to, if you would please, take a moment and introduce yourself, tell us where you work, and what you do in your line of work. And we'll start with you, Christy. learning how to use a microphone. <laughs> I am uh, attached to OGC, attached to BIS temporarily. Okay. Would you say your name again, your full name? Say your name again, because it Christy didn't catch. Christy Potts. Yeah, okay. Good morning. My name is Elon Mitchell G. Uh, I work with the Bureau of Industry and Security in the Office of Nonproliferation and Treaty Compliance. Hello, my name is Brian Costello, and I work for 
National Technical Communications Administration, NTIS. And I've been here for seven and a half years. I'm an electrical engineer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Sekman, and I work for International Trade Administration. I'm a program analyst. Okay, thank you for introducing yourself. So I'd like to point out that each person here today voluntarily volunteered to come in and, and be here with us today. So thank you so much for your courage, for your braveness, and for coming out and talking to everyone in the workforce and helping us to understand how challenge, the challenges can be overcome, but also how you've benefited in working in the federal government. So let's just start off with the, the first question. When and where did you get your start in, the federal, in your federal career? When and where did you get your start in your federal career? And we'll start with you, Christy. That's fine. Sorry, the echo is kind of bad in this room. Um, I joined the federal government in 1997. I was, a pre I was initially employed by the Department of Defense, and I've spent my government career at, so far at the Department of Defense, Department of Navy, Department of Treasury, before I joined the Department of Commerce in 2016. Okay, so you've had opportunity to work in various uh, agencies in the federal government. Great, great, great. How about you, Elon? Where did, where did, when and where did you start your federal career? So I began my federal career in 2007, the summer. Um, I was an intern on Capitol Hill in the office of Congressman John Lewis uh, under the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And I thoroughly enjoyed my experience on the Hill. In fact, I said, at this point, I said, I want to become a public servant forever if I can. So that was my initial start, entry into federal government and exposure to uh, federal service. And from then, um, I did intern at other organizations, uh, federal agencies, Library of Congress, National Archives, EPA. And then in 2010, that's when I segue to US Department of Commerce. And um, I've had a career almost nine years here. So it's been thoroughly enjoyable. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Brian, when did you start your federal career? After I graduated from college, 1985, I went to work for the Defense Mapping Agency, now called National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I worked there for three years. Then I decided to pursue another career track. I went back to college, took several advanced courses in electrical engineering at the University of New Mexico. After that, I had difficulty finding a job. In 1991, I mailed 50 SF-171 applications to federal agencies. Most of them were to agencies in Washington, D.C. area. Only three out of 50 agencies contacted me. The other 47 did not contact me. Eventually, though, in 1992, I was hired by the NTIA as an electronic engineer. And I've been with NTIA ever since, 27 and a half years. Wow, that's a very interesting and long career you've had. But also the fact that you actually applied, you sent out 47, well, 50, 50 applications, the SF-171 for those who remember that, that form. <laughs> and in those days, that, that's a lot. You had to put your own postage on, didn't you? <laughs> so that was a, a great effort there to, to, uh, to get an opportunity for a federal job. And so three called you back, and here you are today. Thank you. Now, Josh. He has a different story. He was recently hired. Josh, will you, you want to tell us about when and where you started your federal career? Okay, first I had my first taste of experience working with the federal government when I was an intern for EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, as a budget 
budget execution for the Office of Water for a few months while I was a student at Gallaudet University. My, for a full-time job with the Department of Commerce is my first full federal government job. I started last March 2019 with International Trade Administration in Washington, D.C. Wow. So I will have to jump in and just say this. Brian and Josh had two distinctly different um, prospects when it came to federal hire, hiring and the way they came into the organization. We had opportunity to talk briefly about this, the differences. So Brian was hired uh, during the time that we just had, right after I believe it was, the ADA, the uh, American with Disabilities Act of 1990 was signed. Mm -hmm. And you had a different hiring experience. Yes, Brian, you can tell us. Yes, the ADA was established in 1990, and I started looking for a job in 1991, and I got accepted in 1992. So, and it was new, very new. Yes, and then Brian, we just actually celebrated the 29th year, I think it was, the 29th year of the signing of the American with Disabilities Act, and, and uh, Josh has entered into the federal government now 29 years after the signing of the ADA with a little bit different experience. Josh, you want to tell us a little bit about your um, hiring experience, how you came to work for the Department of Commerce? Well, like, what was your application process? What did you do to, yeah, your application process? How did you get into the federal government? Well, I didn't send any applications with the Department of Commerce as I was involved in workforce recruitment program that I applied and interviewed to be a part of during my time as a student at Gallaudet University. After I graduated from Gallaudet University, this program helped me to find an opportunity to land a job with the federal government as I was in their database along with my resume. A few years later, my former supervisor, Laura Merchant, who retired last month, contacted me with the job opportunity with the Department of Commerce. She sent me an email. And workforce recruitment program at Gallaudet University, I was limited for two years there. And after I graduated, then I had to really start looking for a job and I got the opportunity to come to Department of Commerce. Awesome. Now, Josh, were you hired under Schedule A? Yes, that is correct, Schedule A. Okay. Also, Brian. Uh, Brian is saying that I filled out a form, 171, with a paragraph that was related to my disability. There was no Schedule A at that time. A person from NTIA, the HR department contacted me after about six months. I had so many questions, but they didn't ask you. They did ask you? They, they did contact me, they did ask me many questions about my disability. There was a wonderful person who interviewed me, who did ask me that, and it was no surprise that it was a person from HR, from NTIA. So again, we can see a lot of the differences. And when Brian was hired, one thing about asking about your disability, well today of course we know that when people are hired for jobs, that's one of the things we say is you, you don't ask about disability, we ask about abilities, your knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job, to show that you're qualified for the job. Also with um, Josh mentioned the workforce recruitment program, 
where if you haven't heard of that, that's an excellent program. Again, we hire, we have an opportunity to recruit from college students uh, and postgraduates through that program, and you can hire them direct into the organization using Schedule A. So we have some very talented individuals from local colleges and universities who we can go into a database, pull the information, and actually hire them for jobs that they're qualified for within the Department of, of Commerce. So again, two different ways, two different time periods, and again, a lot of things have changed. So let me ask you a question, Elon. What was your application process? How did, um, how did it go for you? Did so, into the federal government, I was actually in graduate school at the time, and uh, there was the Student Career Experience Program at the time. You all may be familiar. It lasted for many years. Mm -hmm. It's no longer. It changed or transitioned into the Pathways Program. Mm -hmm. um, but I know my, my interest, my background was in international relations and political science, and commerce had an opportunity. And so um, I still had to compete for the position. Um, there was the USA Jobs application online. I had to complete everything submitted and be interviewed. And after the interview, I was selected um, and hired into that position. And um, so definitely the SCEP program was definitely very beneficial for me. And I would definitely recommend that to any organization. Yeah, but that's a great <laughs> that's a great program as well, right? So there's so many different options. WRP, the, uh, no, no longer SCEP, <laughs> but Pathways program. So yes. definitely another way to get into the federal organization. Now, you didn't have to use Schedule A, right? You just actually no. were able to come in through the internship that program. That is my understanding, yes. yes. Okay, awesome, awesome. And by the way, for those who don't know, Schedule A is an accepted appointing authority, so you don't have to compete. It's another way to get hired without competition. Okay. Um, how about you, Christy? How, what was your application process? Uh, at that time, the Department of, Pro uh, Department of Defense had a program called the Entry Level Program that was designed to hire uh, employees from 5 to 13. Uh, the way it worked was you submitted your application, uh, my master's is in Comparative Regional Studies, Middle East. So I submitted my application to the Department of Defense, and within six weeks, I was notified that I was accepted to the program. And for the next year, I interviewed with various um, offices within the Department of Defense before one selected me as the, uh, as the person they wanted to hire. Awesome, awesome. Sounds like an awesome program as well to give opportunities there. It, it was a good program. I, I don't know if they still continue it, but it was an excellent a program because you knew one point, you know, if you were going to make the cut or not. Mm -hmm. And basically, we, we were told basically it was just a matter of time before there would be a right fit. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So let me ask, anyone can jump in and answer this question. Tell me some of the challenges that you've, um, uh, you've experienced in your pursuit of your you know, of your federal career, uh, like from the first day that you came on board, as since you've been here in the agency, maybe talk about some of the challenges that you've experienced in your federal career. Christy, you'd like to take it? I haven't experienced many challenges. However, there have been occasions where I've had difficulties conveying to individuals that I need special accommodations. I can remember one occasion in another agency, not this one, where I was a note taker for the meetings. I requested a seat at the table and I got a lot of grief from people about why a junior person would be needing to be a seat at the table. It was because for me, when you look at me, I can follow you, but when you look to the side, I have more difficulty understanding you. Um, I think one of the challenges that still exists is the um, awareness among HR professionals as well as managers about the requirements for regional accommodation. I think that's, I think we've come a long way, but I think there's still a lot of ignorance um, that, that the department is required to provide reasonable accommodations to basically ensure you get the best out of the employee. Yeah, and so let me ask you, when you talk about um, those, those challenges, was it a difficult thing to make that um, known to those who, who were there with you that you needed some type of accommodation? Did you have a challenge in, in speaking up and letting them know? No, because I think I had a great deal, I think the individuals who was working with had a great deal of respect for me and they knew I was a competent employee. So basically at that point once I identified that, hey, I need this and this is why, I ended up getting what I wanted, which was basically see the table to ensure the notes I was taking were more accurate, which at the end of the day was what everyone wanted. Awesome. So again, that being able to just voice 
what you need. It was very helpful in this particular case. It got you what you needed so you can do your job. And Correct. I think at the end of the day, I understood. I think they got it finally that, you know, as more time on, they realized that, you know, that I was having trouble catching the conversations awesome. because of the way, I, where I was sitting at the table. I was sitting way in the back and the people were talking in front of me and I couldn't see their faces and um, it became more challenging. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I would like to add, similar to my colleagues' experience, um, I'm an employee with a hidden disability, so many of my colleagues are not aware, they don't know, and I am a very private person, so I never disclose to anyone. Um, but there did come a time where um, I needed to take appropriate measures, I thought, to contact an appropriate representative at Commerce, and uh, because my manager was not quite understanding um, of me using my, you know, time, my sick leave that was accrued. And, um, you know, that was a very difficult conversation because I didn't think that it was necessary to disclose. So I think Mr. Smuke in your office uh, sent out a mass email, and I think it was October about two or three years ago, and it was just an informational session. I said, I think I should just attend just to hear and see. And during that session, I did have a, an opportunity to hear you know, what qualified and what not to see, if maybe there is an opportunity for provisions. And the main thing is I just wanted a, a reasonable accommodation to see if I could, you know, complete my duty hours when I had uh, flare-ups. And so uh, just keeping that simple there, um, I was able to provide the required documentation so that I could, you know, modify the schedule as needed during that season of my life. And so, yes, that's all. Well, and thank you, thank you for sharing. So that you, you both mentioned something that's very key to uh, working and being successful in your work career. Mm -hmm. It's a reasonable accommodations. Many employees are not aware initially, especially if you're new to the federal government, that we provide a reasonable accommodation. And that really is just simply a modification or a change in the way that things are customarily done mm -hmm. so that you can perform the essential functions of your job. So again, we talked about earlier about having differing abilities. Well, all of us face different challenges and sometimes we just need just a little change maybe it's a change in the work hours just a slight change in the work hours or a, allowing uh, you know flexibility in telework or maybe some uh, type of assistive devices or equipment or something like that that will help us to be able to be successful in performing our job even something as simple as a chair can be an accommodation however employees are not always aware that they can make a request for that most accommodations don't cost anything for the agency to provide. And even those that cost, they're very minimal costs. So thank you for sharing that and how it, uh, and, and, and let me ask you a question. How was your work performance improved by your accommodation? Extremely better environment. Uh, my health is doing much better as a result of the accommodation. Um, you know, I am accomplishing all requirements, you know, in terms of that meeting all my milestones. So um, it was more of an added benefit to the employee so that I could produce at my optimum level. And so I'm so thankful that the Department of Commerce does offer reasonable accommodations. Thank you, awesome. Now, Brian, how about you? What challenges did you happen to face? Oh, did you happen to face any challenges and how did you overcome them since you've been in, a, in your federal career? <laughs> yes. Well, there have been a lot of challenges uh, in my 27 and a half years. Um, I started working here in 1992 and on the first day of the job, I was sitting down at a brown desk, brown table, and it was, it was, there were empty drawers in there. And there was a black phone on the table. <laughs> and so I informed them that I had taken lip reading and speech training when I was young. And I could understand some people. But still it was a struggle for me to lip read many people. From 92 to about 94, I requested an interpreter to support me in lectures and meetings, staff meetings, um, whatever I needed it. A, a sign language interpreter helped me a lot to understand more than lip reading. So it really helped me a lot when I had the sign language interpreter. 
So about 1994, I requested an interpreter again. And during that time, the Office of Civil Rights had set up an interpreting service. So I would go directly to the Office of Civil Rights and make my request. My agency also provided an interpreter. If the Office of Civil Rights interpreter was not available, then I would ask my agency to provide the interpreting service for me. Since then, I have noticed a big change. Great changes have occurred since that time, both technological and cultural. However, much has changed since that time. Interpreting services are now available, and the technological advances in digital communications have brought revolutionary changes in the way people communicate. Examples would include video relay service, text messaging, email, link, L-Y-N-C, messaging, and word processing, which has taken the place of exchanging handwritten notes. These have helped me tremendously and reduced but by no means eliminated the special challenges in communicating that are experienced by any person with deafness. Also, in the last 20 years, the department has fostered a support structure for all persons with disabilities. I have been the beneficiary of increased support especially with regard to interpreting services. Oh, Brian, thank you so much for that, because you, you brought up a couple of things. One, you mentioned that dreaded black phone. Um, I know one of the advances today that we have is video phone, which is, <laughs> which is so much better than that dreaded black phone. <laughs> I just wanted to know just quickly, how were you able to use that phone? Did you have like an amplifier or anything on that phone? How no, 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 no amplification of anything. I didn't talk on the phone at all. Yeah, so not a very inclusive environment at that time, we can clearly see. In my office now, I do have a video phone. And so I make calls through the video relay service. And Josh, you have a video phone set up also, correct? I believe... In the early 2000s, they didn't have the video phone set up at that time? Yeah. But I don't remember for sure. No, you're correct, because that, that technology has come up within, I've been in this field now since 2009, dealing with the disability program, and they actually just really started putting that in the federal agencies within the last 10 years. So uh, you're correct, they did not have that in the early part of the, uh, there was a lot of FCC changes that had to be made with the federal communications um, company to allow that within federal agencies. But it, it, technology has benefited all of us, and of course, you know, definitely we can see how it's made it a more inclu inclusive work environment and made it work more efficient, not just for you or individuals with disabilities, but also for myself and for others, just to be able to have ability to text and to quickly send messages and, yeah, just so many, um, innovations that has helped us all. So thank you for sharing with that with us, uh, Brian. And we know that you're, you have a wonderful staff sign language interpreter, Mr. Francisco Roman, <laughs> who has been just very, very in instrumental in this department in making sure that our individuals who are deaf are able to have um, sign language interpreting when needed. We also, again, like you said, set up the contract so that employees can have what they need. So thank you so much for sharing, with that, sharing that with us. Now, Josh, as our newest employee on this panel here, 
<laughs> yes, yes. We are glad that you have you're joined us. Thank you so much for being, you know, choosing Commerce as your employer. We really, truly appreciate that you're here. Please talk to us. Uh, just since you've been here, what have you uh, seen that has, has made you think that um, Commerce is definitely the place for you? An organization that you really are glad to be a part of. Tell me some of the inclusive practices that you've noticed. Well, when I started working here, uh, my dream was uh, to work at DOC. I really wanted to uh, uh, apply here right after graduating from Gallaudet University. Um, I knew that I would be a good fit in the Department of Commerce. So uh, as I got closer and closer to uh, my time to apply here, I, I just couldn't wait for that. I really wanted to be involved and I wanted to show that I can do it. I wanted to show that the deaf can do things. And when I arrived, I thought there would be a lot of deaf people here, but there was only one, <laughs> one deaf person. And so I wanted to show that maybe in the future, perhaps we'll recruit more deaf to come and work here because deaf can do it. Deaf can do it. And I wanted to show that. And this is a great place to do that. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do in your job? I work as, uh, at, at, I'm sorry, I work as an administrative analyst. I'm an analyst for ITA. I work in the Office of Enforcement. Information and technology is part of my job, which uh, I handle the equipment. I give out equipment for people who go on assignments. Uh, if they need equipment, they make a request for it, and I process that equipment. Uh, when people come back from their assignments, I have to process the equipment back into our inventory. I have to make sure that they have all working parts to their computer and their phones. I want to make sure that um, I put things in the sunflower system, make sure that the inventory is definitely taken care of. I'm responsible for many things that people need when they have to perform their job. And now I'm taking training as a contract officer, a core. And so I'm hoping that one day soon um, I will become a core. And then uh, when I finish that training in 2020, I'll be a core. And that's one of the things that many opportunities have been offered to me here. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Okay, so now we, we are wrapping it, we're getting close to the, la the half at the middle point of our, um, of our interview today and I'm really appreciating you being here. I just want to ask you just a little bit more about your experiences within the Department of Commerce and specifically, what would you recommend to an individual who seeks employment with the, the federal government or Department of Commerce, but specifically in the federal agencies? What would you recommend for a person with a disability who would like to come and work in this department? Um, anybody? You wanna go? Uh, okay. Well, I wanna say uh, just because you disclose a disability um, to an appropriate official in your agency does not mean that you cannot advance in your career. That's what I wanna make very clear. And I always feared or I was shied away from disclosing, you know, in the event that I did need some special accommodation because again, for fear of not advancing in my career or being given less work or saying, you know, feeling pity for it. And I didn't want that. But what I do know, and I'm a living testament today, that you can advance in your career. You can do meaningful work that you're passionate about. You know, you can establish relationships with interagency, you know, officials, and you can build that and you can have a fruitful career, I would say. And so don't, don't shy away if you need that service. You know, feel open to go to the appropriate representative and um, just state your case, what's going on, and find a reasonable way um, to make it work. And it will, it'll work. Brian? I'm hoping that this will get to the top level management folks. This is very important um, with, and also with HR. Uh, the people who are there in HR who are willing and enthusiastic to hire people with disabilities. 
I don't have the authority. I mean, I can't hire people. Uh, I'm not a manager. You are the managers. You are the top level folks. You're the people in HR. And you have to work with the supervisors to make sure that you pick the best qualified people. And if there are people with disabilities, hire them. Give them a chance. Uh, because they will improve the environment in which you find them. Very enthusiastic people, very talented people. People with disabilities can do it. And I'm hoping that one day the folks in HR and any agency, that they will be aggressive in their hiring practices for people with disabilities. And Brian, thanks for sharing about how the department can be, you know, can really make more opportunities or really go after recruitment of people with disabilities. So if you were a person on the outside and you wanted to come and work for the federal agency, what would, might you recommend for a person who may maybe even see this, this video or the broadcast and say, hey, you know, I would love to come and work for the agency. What, what kind of recommendation would you give? Just a quick, brief recommendation. Well, <laughs> we could come back to you. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, they can contact you, Monique, just mute. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you insist. <laughs> I, I would definitely point them in the right direction. <laughs> Yes, yes, you If will. I may add, uh, I've yes, never Christine. felt like my disability, my hearing impairment has ever held me back. Uh, it's enabled me to have a very productive and fruitful career that I've been able to use my talents for the betterment of the U.S. government. My only recommendation always is to be upfront with your supervisors. Let them know what things you can do that will help them in their job. And I think if there's a will, there's a way. I think there's a way to get around well, not get around, I think there's a way to work through the system to ensure that the employees have those things they need to make them productive and make them be able to basically serve the American people, which is what we're here for. Absolutely. Thank you, Christy. And you know, it's really interesting because in the, in the day and age we live in today, there is so much more awareness about employing people with disabilities. It really is a big push among the federal government to increase the participation rates of those who work in the federal agencies. And so there are a lot of initiatives out there and a lot of organizations really working and pushing to hire people with disabilities. So there are a lot of resources and I appreciate you, you all sharing, you know, really reaching out to managers, supervisors, hiring officials, HR, to really aggressively look for people with disabilities as you hire. Now, it is, it is part of my job, thank you, Brian, <laughs> to help make people make connections so that managers and supervisors can connect with HR and different organizations to be able to recruit. So that is one of our efforts and our aims. So we will continue to do that. So last, I want... <laughs> Lastly, I want to ask <laughs> Brian's applauding. Josh, what, any recommendations you would have, especially uh, for anybody who would like to come and work for the federal government, anything that you would encourage them to do? Yes, I would recommend and encourage people to come. Uh, it, it's a very, it, do well in school. Make sure your interests uh, are varied in school. Be aggressive in, in, in the opportunities that are out there. Take advantage of all the opportunities. Take as many courses as you can, um, really, really get involved in, in different subjects because uh, you never know when you're in the government what will open up for you, what opportunities are there. Um, really invest your time in school, that's so important. After you graduate, you will get the opportunities to work in the federal government, and that's key. Very important, school that's valued here in the government, and that's how I got here. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that because, you know, that really is the key for everybody who's in school, whether you have a disability or not. D be diverse. Get as much, uh, you know, knowledge and opportunities that you can. Take advantage of it. Um, intern, like you just mentioned. Get opportunities to intern. Even volunteer, and volunteer work counts. So thank you for that. Now, I just want to ask uh, just one more question. Well, two more questions I have for you. So, one, if you are in the federal agency and you, you are working here now and you've been through you know, a few years of having this under your belt, some of the difficulties that you've had to overcome, really appreciate that. 
What accomplishments have you been able to make now that you've been in the government, you've, you've, you've overcome a lot of the difficulties, you've gotten reasonable accommodations, you've made it known to your senior or to your supervisors and managers that you have some, you know, some uh, needs to perform your job effectively. So can you talk about your accomplishments, any of your achievements, anything you'd like to just brag about? This is your moment. <laughs> Yes, I'd like to add that when I started here, um, there were several barriers. Um, I had to take training, of course, uh, lots of training. And some of the videotapes had no captions. Mm -hmm. And that was very frustrating for me when I had to take my, my, my training to learn my job specifically. So I got a reasonable accommodation. I asked for the interpreter who came in and did the interpreting for me. And hopefully in the future when they hire more people that they won't face the same frustrations that I've faced. But I did overcome. Let me see if there's anything else. Um, another way um, is to get involved with service. Um, sometimes people ask, well, how do you communicate? I find another way. Um, you know, Microsoft Word is on every computer. I can use that to communicate with a person. We can type back and forth. Um, there's text app on the cell phone that I use, and I show people how to use that. So there are different ways that you can resolve those issues and barriers. Um, and also, my interpreter, Francisco, has been very available to me to help me. Um, Sometimes at the last minute, I'll call him, and you know, if he has time, he'll come. If he doesn't, he'll let me know. And then being with a very understanding supervisor, we rescheduled the appointment so that we can have the reasonable accommodation. Because at the end of the day, it's about getting the work done. We're looking forward to maybe getting a contract in the future so I can have an interpreter a few more hours when I need them. When I become a core, which I will, I know that I will need an interpreter more. So if the Office of Civil Rights can't provide it, my office will be able to provide that reasonable accommodation for me. There are many different ways to overcome the obstacles. That's what I wanted to say. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Brian says, yeah, it's the same situation for me. The closed captions sometimes, when I watch them, I see them on the internet and on the videos. Sometimes they're not on. They don't have closed captions, so what do I do? Well, I have to find another way to overcome that obstacle. But closed captions really helps a lot. And I hope that someday all materials that are in video form will have the closed open captions. Okay, thank you. So do you have any, any type of um Anything about it that you've accomplished or achieved within your career that you'd like to happen to mention, Brian, in, your, in the years that you've been in the federal government? Do you, any particular achievements? I have a lot of accomplishments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a, a lot of technical work is done in my office and I've been able to handle that with the, with the reasonable accommodations that I've been given. And I also know you work uh, with the, uh, um, you have to have a, uh, you work with um, highly, I think it's um, classified, you work with classified, in a classified environment. So you have had opportunity also to work in an environment that requires you to have a top secret clearance and to be able to work in a cl with a classified um, material, data, whatever. So again, you have some accomplishments that, you know, everybody, is, you have to be qualified to do it. That's the bottom line. One of the reasons that I, I went to work for the Department of Mapping, the mapping agency, mm -hmm. is uh, when I worked there, uh, they were able to help me uh, get the job here. When I was accepted through that agency, it was easy to transfer over to here, to the Department of Commerce. Right, okay, thank you. Elon? 
I would just add, uh, uh, back in 2018, um, I do a lot of policy work, and I did country policy, Sudan and South Sudan primarily, and Syria. And uh, one of my biggest um, accomplishments that I was proud of is to contribute to the interagency process and revoking certain economic sanctions on Sudan that occurred, um, as well as we did have some entity list nominations because a lot of violence was going on in South Sudan. So the U.S. government, we definitely took some uh, measures to move forward to make sure that uh, genocide did not continue in South Sudan um, in terms of U.S. funds being diverted to, um, you know, do illicit traffic and weapons and whatnot. So there's a whole connection point there, but I would say I'm most proud of that accomplishment because I was able to contribute. And regardless of any health issues that I experienced, I was able to persevere. Um, the reasonable accommodation, like I said, helped me complete my duty hours, so I'm thankful for that. But um, I'm so thankful to have contributed to that. So that was one of my recent accomplishments. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Christy. Uh, I was very fortunate when I came into federal service that two individuals who I work with kind of looked over and kept uh, provided some, you know, basically training because I was a new federal employee and they really mentored me and were really good about, hey, you do it this way, you do it that way. Um, so as I'm 22 years into federal service, I think my greatest joy is grooming those individuals who will come after me, recognizing that my job is to patch the torch to the next generation. And I guess for me, seeing them accomplish things is, even though it has nothing to do with me, gives me great satisfaction. There's nothing better than getting an employee who works for you promoted. Mm -hmm. uh, and seeing them move on and maybe to another job that requires more responsibility. So that's, that's where I get my personal satisfaction. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. So I have one last question for you and then we're gonna open it up to the audience if they have any questions that they'd like to ask our panelists. So the one last question I have is I'd like each person to just tell me one interesting fact about yourself or about our interests, your hobby, something about yourself that you'd like to share, you don't mind the audience knowing about you. Just tell us one interesting <laughs> fact. <laughs> okay, Josh, you can okay. start. Okay, interesting fact about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, where? Horsey, horsey country. That's, it's one of the best places on earth. So that's where I, I was born and raised. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Oh, Hershey. yes. Oh, yeah. Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. We're, we're very familiar with Hershey, Pennsylvania, where the Hershey's chocolate comes from, correct? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. I've been to that amusement park, too. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. That was my first appointment there was in Hershey Park. My, ah. my first employment was oh, there in Hershey awesome. Park. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Great. How about you, Brian? Uh, a hobby? I can talk about a hobby. Sure. What, what, yeah. Let us know about your hobby. Okay. At the, in the workplace here, there are some words. Inclusion is from my heart. Inclusion is on us. Those are the words <laughs> I'd like to share with you today. Oh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, for sharing that with us. Um, my hobby is really landscaping, doing things outside in my house, beautifying it. I enjoy that. Oh, you like plants and, f you like plants and flowers, huh, Brian? <laughs> no, not flowers, building. I, I do hardscape. Okay, it's the hardscape. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I build a stone wall in my house, uh, a deck, um, and I do a lot of painting around the house. Awesome. Soon I'm gonna plant some flowers, but that'll <laughs> be next year, getting ready for next year. Awesome, great, great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Elon. I would add uh, one of my uh, hobbies, my most favorite sport is tennis. 
uh, and uh, just really enjoy some competition there. I have to know when to uh, stop getting a ball, as my classmates would say. Uh, they call me smiley on the court all the time. <laughs> Um, but uh, definitely very competitive and, and sport of tennis. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Keeps you in great shape, right? It does. <laughs> yes. I have to get some point tips from you sometime. Uh, Christy? Some of the audience know I'm a runner, so my take pride in being able to say I completed two marathons. Wow, wow. Uh, so you, you do this now. This is something you still enjoy doing regularly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'm doing awesome. the Marine Corps 10K at the end of the month, so I'm looking forward to that. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So you see we have a, a wealth of diverse talent within this department, skills, knowledge, abilities, and just their just plain interest, just the things that they're interested in, the things they do, and then the commitment and dedication to the Department of Commerce. It's definitely, you spoke that in everything that you spoke today, your dedication, your commitment. And we thank you so much for being a part of this panel and for joining us today. So I'm going to open this up to the audience. And if you have any specific questions you'd like to ask our panelists, now is the time, opportunity to get to know your panelists a little better. I see one hand out in the audience. No, no, you need that mic. mic. Okay. Hello? Okay. Uh, Brian mentioned that he had uh, seen so many changes from the time he was hired to the current time. And I'm wondering if anybody on the panel has a wish list of things they'd like to see in the next time period. Anybody can take it. Brian, you want to you answer first? Sure. Well, the technology has changed a lot. That's the most important part. I mean, since 1992, uh, the computers. Um, I remember when I started here, the computers, they had a black screen on them. <laughs> and, and you had the C prompt, which you had to uh, program in what you wanted the computer to do. I remember my first job that I got, it was Word Perfect. That was the first w w word processing. <laughs> word Perfect, and now it's Microsoft Word. And it's, it's so different. A lot of changes. Ten years after 1992, I got a video phone. <laughs> A uh, lot of changes like that, uh, communication especially, access to communication, um, those, those barriers and challenges have really been broken down. Video phone has really changed and improved. The video phone technology has really improved a lot. It's helped communication. That's one of the best things that we have going for us, and I've noticed that's a big change since 1992. Thank you, yeah. We're, we're all laughing because, you know, many of us who've been in the federal government at least 25 years or more, we know about the, the C prompt on the black screen <laughs> and the word perfect. I remember that so clearly. Now, Josh, you, you're probably looking like, what? What was that? Because you, you wouldn't have had experience with that. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Sorry. I'm, I'm the young guy here, so no so, idea. But Josh, do you have um, an answer to the question that she had here? Any, any uh, wish list, anything that you would say, bucket list or things that we should get within the federal government that you, you, know, you would recommend that you would love to see us have one day so far since you've been involved? Uh, well, I believe that... We have everything so far that's good, but one negative, the captions. We have no captions okay. on all of our materials. Uh, the videos, in general, uh, they should be all captioned. And um, I think that would be great. But so far, what I have been satisfied with what I've seen so far. A lot of advances have been made. 
Thank you. And I'm glad you brought that up. So in the future, we will be having a workshop. We're actually going to have a workshop because what he's speaking of is Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act requires that we actually provide captioning on videos. Anything that we're showing to the public or to the workforce, it should have captions. So again, some of the materials, some of the development of videos within the agency, uh, they may be older videos or they may be things that were developed and uh, there was not an awareness that it needed to be captioned, but we're working to make sure we take care of that and, and make sure that all of our videos, especially stuff from mandatory training and so forth, it needs to be captioned. So our office, the Office of Civil Rights, has definitely been working with the agency to ensure that that, that happens. Yeah. And just, uh, we got about a minute, a minute or two left. So we if you wanna. There's a, there's a couple questions. I think okay. there's one on the WebEx. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to say, Josh, someone was very impressed with you that you're going for your core training and we have some networking opportunities for you, so come speak to me later. Great. Thank you. And I have a question. First, I want to thank Monique as the Disability Program Manager for Commerce and Cisco, who is our sign language interpreter for their services to the community and the panelists, I am really excited and I appreciate you sharing and dispelling the stereotypes and myths about people with disabilities because you're obviously um, doing it in the workplace and we appreciate your efforts. And the question that I have is, what is the one thing that we can do as your coworkers to make you feel more included in the workplace? We heard about how your supervisors have provided accommodations but I'd like to know as a coworker, what can I do to make you feel more included at the Department of Commerce? Can we start with, with you, Christine? We'd like, I'd like, we'd like to get everybody's input on this one, real, if we can. I, I think it's basically recognizing that uh, there may be something that you can do in working with a coworker that makes it easier for them to work, whether it, it receives it, you send a tasking and writing because you realize the person receives that information best or if you're hearing impaired, try to look at the person in the face, makes it easier for us to follow uh, what they're saying. But I think it's just you basically gearing whatever you do for your coworkers that makes it easier for them to accomplish the task that they're being given. I also like what you, you mentioned to me a little bit earlier. It's about an attitude as well. In some cases, sometimes individuals are not always aware of how they make you feel and how they can make you feel included or excluded, but being conscious and aware of how they are treating you, talking to you, and even some of the jokes or comments that may be made in your presence. You mentioned that to me earlier. Totally agree. Right. Yes. Yeah. I honestly have not thought about that question before. Um, I would say I did disclose my condition with two or three of my close colleagues. Um, and uh, doing that, I felt um, a sense of relief, to be honest, to be able to do that so they could understand my uh, personal journey um, through, you know, my career and just life in general. But um, I'm sure there are ways uh, to make things better and I will think about that question and maybe have a better response <laughs> next time. <laughs> Brian, just like in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> um, uh, I have no comment, I'm sorry, no okay. comment. No problem, no problem. Okay. We can move it to Josh. Just want to give everybody an opportunity. Um, I've noticed that when it comes to customer service, for example, um, I'm responsible for handing out travel laptops um, and, and keeping those in inventory. If someone comes to me and they try to talk to me, I would let them know I'm deaf. And then uh, I would have them maybe start trying to write or fingerspell something very carefully. Um, so if people could just learn basic gestures, signs, and maybe some alphabets, that would be great. Awesome, thank you so much. And this is something that we definitely have had, uh, tried to also do in the department, thanks to our wonderful staff, sign language interpreter, providing some workshops. So get involved, definitely. Okay, we have one more question from the audience. Yes. Cisco, I know that you've recently offered some ASL classes. Is there any thought to given to having like a regular gathering of those people who have taken the classes so they can continue to improve and keep their skills up? Uh, yes, I would say that um, 
Every Wednesday in the cafeteria, we have a group of people, hearing and deaf, and we get together and we sit and we do sign language. It's non-threatening environment. So you can come and you can join in the group and meet some wonderful people and learn some great sign language skills, or you can just sit on the side at the next table and just watch. <laughs> and you won't be threatened either way. Actually, it's very fascinating as well. And I will mention there's one more thing we do. We actually have a group. It's called the Differing Abilities Employee Resource Group. I have to put a plug out there for that because that group just, we recently formed that group. Our uh, chairperson on that group is Ms. Wendy Dornberg, who's standing right here in the room. If you'd like more information about that group, it's an opportunity for people with disabilities to come together or people who support people with disabilities, people who support inclusion. <laughs> Brian's holding up a different ability pin. So that group is a support networking group that you know definitely want to hear issues, concerns, also give resources, um, encourage, inspire. That's exactly what we do. So please come and join us for that group. Uh, Wendy will be around after this so she can tell you about when we meet and love to have you participate. Now I just want to leave the final word for our, our director for the Office of Civil Rights, Ms. Tanisha Agramonti. She is here and I'd like to have her come forward so that people oh. can see you on the camera. Okay, for, great. For this last word. Thank you again so much, Monique, and I want to thank all the panelists again for coming and sharing your stories. It's so important for the rest of the workforce to really understand your journeys and to understand how we can better be more inclusive of you and for the biggest purpose of making sure that you can contribute to us accomplishing the mission. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, what I wanted to say, and I try to underscore this at every event for people with disabilities where we're focusing on this, is that a lot of times we don't think about reasonable accommodations as being something that everyone gets, regardless of having a disability. So all of the folks that are sitting here right here in a seat, that chair was provided for your comfort and for your ability to participate today, right? But if you were a wheelchair user, the government could have saved all the money on these chairs, <laughs> right, that we just provided, or light, that we provide. People who are sighted need light. People who are hearing need audio. So we don't think about ways in which we're being accommodated on a day-to-day -day basis. So I just wanted to underscore that accommodations are not doing anything special you know, for anyone. We're all being accommodated just in different ways and all those accommodations allow all of us to contribute. So thank you for that education today. I appreciate that. Let's give our panelists a hand. Thank you so much for coming out today and joining us, taking time out of your, your schedule. Thank you to all of you in, in WebEx land for joining us as well and for our audience here. And I will just ask you one favor, would you please complete the surveys? We always want to improve our program, so we ask you to please complete those surveys online. There's a link to the survey, and also on the chairs here are, are, are surveys. And you can turn them in at the back, just leave them on, or leave them on your chair. But again, thank you so much for coming out, and uh, pay, look forward to the next event that we do uh, at the end of this month. Thank you very much. <laughs>